Okay. So uh, thanks for your patience with that. Um, and um, Ellen, I'm going to go ahead and advance uh, your slides. Everybody should see a We Feel Connected Do You. Um, and that has all the information for the audio portion of this webinar um, and any technology issues that you might have. So Ellen, I'm going to go ahead and, and forward it and let you get started. Okay, so um, Michelle, just uh, thank you everybody, and thank you Michelle for introducing me. And I also want to thank the staff at Wixap. They've been great in terms of working with them in putting this, um, in putting this webinar together. And so um, as Michelle mentioned, we've been colleagues for the past or quite for many, many years uh, where Michelle and I have worked together and particularly working together most recently with the resource, resource sharing project. Um, I believe if the slide, um, Michelle, just let me know if it's the one that the first slide should be the polling question. Um, is that the slide that's up? Michelle? And so first of all, I just want to apologize. I've been having problems with uh, connecting on my end and been working on the trying to get connected into the webinar. So we're kind of having to do this manually and so I have a copy of the slides in front of me. But hopefully the first slide that you have in front of you should be the polling question, which I'd just like That's you correct. folks to just respond in terms of um, which one of the following um, positions best describes um, the role that you play at your agency. So if you could just take a, a few seconds just to respond and we can kind of get a sense of who's on the line or who's, who's online today. Okay, people are taking it and we're getting responses. Okay, so I'm just trying to get a sense of who's online. So, um, so it looks Michelle. like we've got uh, five executive directors, excuse me, six, 27 program directors or managers, three finance administrative staff, six program staff, and then other, uh, we have four, and described in the chat, uh, somebody has said uh, development or communications director. Okay. Well, great. Thank oh, you. Oh, and I'm also there's some funders from our state office great. on the line as well. Well, thank you all for joining today's call. It just gives me a sense of who's online, and it looks like many of you have some um, sort of managerial role or particularly have had responsibility in supervising staff or possibly supervising volunteers. So hopefully with this information that I'm sharing with you in today's webinar um, may be helpful in terms of enhancing your knowledge and your abilities. And also I'm a firm believer that, you know, um, although I may bring many, many years of experience in terms of um, being a director and for having a variety of roles at nonprofits and supervise many staff and volunteers over the years, um, that I think it's always still an opportunity where we can still learn from each other and that you folks may have feedback and comments and um, experiences or best practices that you've utilized that I really want to encourage you to also feel free to share in the chat box as we move for, through today's webinar. And also if you have any questions at any time, feel free to jot them in the chat box. Um, I know Michelle will probably help chime in and um, have those questions or ask those questions as we move along and so we can address them as we go. And so also there will be time at the end of today's webinar where they'll, hopefully we'll still have a few minutes remaining that we can um, have an opportunity to have you folks share feedback or share any kind of comments or questions that you have. Again, it, I, we just want to really provide this as interactive, a learning opportunity um, for us to learn more in terms of ways that we can empower our staff and build our agency's organizational capacity. So we can move on to the next slide. That should be the one on the learning goals. You bet that basically um, today what my focus of today's webinar is really about helping all of you as participants to increase your knowledge about how to assess your staff and personnel management needs and also begin talking about how to develop staff work plans and succession planning processes for your staff and overall just addressing some um, questions and some pieces of information regarding staff supervision, training, and performance reviews. And so a lot of this may not be new to you, but um, again, feel free to chime in at any time if you have any questions or feedback that you'd like to share or experiences that you've had. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, usually when I do a presentation uh, about uh, addressing staff and um, supervision and personnel management types of needs, I usually try to draw upon a couple of um, popular types of examples. And so 
one um, one particular business um, or entrepreneur out there that actually has a show that many of you may or may not have seen on CNNBC is The Prophet. And this is Marcus Lomonas, who is a CEO of Camping World. And what's interesting is he's the host of this show. And um, as somebody who's a very wealthy entrepreneur and successful businessman, I think some of his information and some of the, the models that he shares is very relevant to those of us in the nonprofit sector. And with his show, The Profit, his show is basically talks about how he invests his own money in struggling businesses um, and really helping to troubleshoot and help them to, to invest in their work that he believes in and also to help them grow and flourish and profit, increase their, um, you know, increase their sales and increase the success of their organization. And so this show has been on for several years, and um, I know that personally. I, I watch it from time to time because I think it's just really interesting, the work that he does, and that he pretty much inv invests his own money to really work with struggling organizations. And the model that he really focuses on is this slide where it exemplifies the three Ps of a successful organization. And again, I feel that it has relevance in terms of the nonprofit sector as well. That he really talks about the three elements of any successful organization, that we talk about the three Ps. The first P being the people, the staff and leadership of your organization. And honestly, what he really focuses in on in terms of staffing, that he talks about that being the most valuable resource for any successful organization. The second P that he talks about is process, that how the organization functions and develops and provides their product, which I think in the nonprofit sector, we talk about that in terms of the services that we provide to our communities. Um, but really the process, which is really talking about the procedures, the systems that we have in place, and specifically as it relates to staff, it's really the process in which we interact with our staff and manage our staff on a day-to-day -day basis. And the third P is really the product, which I mentioned before for nonprofits. It's really the services um, that we provide to our community. And so for any organization that's successful, it really has this synergy among, among those three Ps, that all three elements need to work in sync, and that we have good functioning process, and we have good services, and we have good people, and we help to maintain and support the good people that are in our work. Um, usually with organizations that struggle, there's usually a, a breakdown in one of the P's. And usually when there's a breakdown in one of the P's, it also impacts the others. Like particularly if we have challenges with our staffing, it's definitely going to have an impact on our services. If we have bad process in place or don't have systems in place, it will definitely have a negative impact on our staff, and it ultimately may have a negative impact on our services. So again, I usually kind of refer to this model, and we'll kind of talk a little bit more about this, especially as we talk about supervision, and specifically when we talk about succession planning, that we really have to look at all three Ps. So we can move on to the next slide. Okay. And I, I touched on this before, that it's just highlighting these two key points. When organizations struggle, there's usually a challenge with one of the three Ps, and it will ultimately impact all three elements at any time. And that successful nonprofits um, have strong, strong and healthy people or staff and process and the services that we provide to our community. And we can move on to the next slide. That, okay. as I mentioned before, that our staff is the most valuable resource at our agency. And I'm a firm believer in that. that um, and I think also that for nonprofits, compared to most other industries in the private or public sector, that we usually do a great job in terms of hiring great people um, and securing great volunteers for our organizations. And that many times, most nonprofits are probably more successful in the way that they supervise and really pay attention to the needs of their staff. It's not to say that, that our agencies don't struggle from time to time, but generally, by and large, we, as an industry, we tend to do a really strong great job in, in um, hiring great staff and maintaining staff, and that we usually are very attentive to that. It's not to say that we can improve in these areas, and hopefully with today's webinar, we'll talk about some other strategies that we can use or that many of you may be using in place to help support and empower your staff to do great work, to, to do the great work that you do in your communities. So we can move on to the next slide, which is talking about assessing staff needs. That part of that process is really about really understanding what the needs of our staff and really helping to build that engagement and motivation and investment. So this first piece is about the assessment. And particularly, I usually come with the mindset that it's not a one-size-fits-all approach, that when we talk about each staff person, they may have, we may have to kind of 
tailor our approach or tailor our supervision in terms of what's going to be helping to bring out the best work in that individual. And it's not that we can use the same approach for every staff person. Every, I think we firmly, as we work with survivors, we strongly have a strong value about that we really want to understand each survivor's needs, that we can't take a one-size-fits-all approach, and it's the same with staff, that every person is unique, brings their own history, their own um, essence of who they are, their own characteristics, they also come in with their own cultural experiences um, as we do our work with that value of an anti-oppression and anti-racism lens that we also need to honor who each individual is. So what that means is that we need to kind of get a sense in building that connection with that individual. And partly it's also understanding who they are, what they bring to the table, but also getting a sense of what is the best, how do they, what's the best style of communication? How do they like to be supervised? What motivates or inspires them to bring their best work or to do their best work? So part of that, we have to kind of really think about how do we gather staff input and feedback? And how do we as supervisors or managers or directors, how do we respond to their feedback? Um, and what I'd like to do is if you have any thoughts about this, to feel free to jot down some of your experiences or perspectives in the chat box. And I would ask if Michelle wouldn't mind reading some of that off. Um, and then I think the other piece of it, the other question that we need to think about when we're talking about assessing staff needs is what do staff need from their supervisors? So it's really thinking about the motivators, what motivates them and inspires them to do their best work. How do, wh how do they like to be recognized for good work? Um, what do they need in terms of training? What do they need in terms of professional development? And I know it's sometimes hard for many of us at our respective centers that we have so much work that we need to get done. But part of it is thinking about how can we build in these types of questions or systems in the way that we do regular supervision? Do we have um, a process in place to do performance reviews on an annual basis or whatever the frequency may be? But at the very least, we strongly encourage performance reviews to happen on an annual basis. So just thinking about some of those ways that we may already have in, or systems that we may have in place, or if we don't have them in place, how do we want to go about having a conversation as management staff or as supervisors to think about what systems we need to put in place for our organization? And also just how we build in some of that dialogue or conversation in our regular supervision meetings with staff. And also do we ask these kinds of questions even when we hire or during the orientation process? in terms of how do people like to be supervised? How frequently do they feel like, um, do they feel comfortable enough in the, even in between supervision meetings to ask questions from their supervisors? And also just having that conversation about what's the best way for us to communicate that. Do, you know, there are some folks, like especially for many millennial staff, sometimes they like to have it more in terms of um, emails or even, even some communication happening via text you know, that they might be more comfortable doing it in that regard, in that manner, whereas where some folks may prefer to have more of it being a verbal co conversation. So Ellen, just trying one, to help out. Sorry, Ellen, go ahead, in, please. One, uh, one uh, comment in the chat box, or question rather, uh, from Julie, and she says, I am interested in the best way to gather input from staff. Are there any resources you can provide in terms of surveys or evaluations that might fit for most agencies? Um, I can probably link, provide some resources. I think with some of the resources that I'll provide at the end have some templates in there. And so what I'll do is follow up with Michelle in doing that. Some of that might be adapting some existing processes that you have in place. Like that might be something, some questions that you would want to integrate into some of the hiring questions or at least in the very beginning when you do any staff orientation with new staff coming on board, that those may be some just simple questions that you add to your orientation packet. And then I would just add, this is Michelle, I would just add that, that also that we're adding things into when we do one-on-one -on -one supervision. If we have a form or something mm -hmm. like that that we're talking about how, um, how communication is working kind of on an ongoing mm -hmm. basis, what kind of things can we improve, et cetera, right? And so we're working in pieces of assessing those staff needs into multiple places um, right. instead of just having it either on the front end or back end. No, definitely. I think it needs to be an ongoing type of dialogue. And also what 
may be something that one staff person may mention early on, and partly because they're just trying to think about how they want to be supervised and how communication needs to happen. And then finding out as they continue this relationship with their supervisor that some of that might change, or even the supervisor might notice that that may have changed. And so it's always important to have that check-in process. And especially as you know, staff may be dealing with new challenges or new projects or new deliverables that they have, that what may be the existing form of communication that worked best for them may not work with the specific type of new task or project that they're undertaking. So it's usually important to kind of just create, a, create multiple feedback loops or just even incorporating that in just on a regular check-in basis with, when you're doing supervision with your staff, whether you're doing it weekly or every other week, just asking, like, is there anything that we should improve in the way that we're communicating? What do you need from me? Like a standard question I usually ask of staff that I supervise, what is it that I can do to help support you during the next week or two that you're working on doing your work? And that's usually the common question I ask on an ongoing basis. How can I best support you to do your work? What do you need from me to make that happen? And then even opening it up in terms of not just in terms of communication, but are, is there additional information you need or support, or what is it that you need in terms of support? So I'm hoping, does that make sense for folks, or any other thoughts or feedback? There's nothing else in the chat. Okay. So other kinds of, as we talked about, like um, some other common, common questions is asking what type of communication works best for them. And so another way of framing that is in, in regular supervision. It's just like we've been, you know, this is how, like whatever feedback you may have gotten from staff before, from your staff person before in terms of communication modality or process, it's just also helpful to have a, to kind of just have a regular check-in kinds of question saying, is the communication working at this time the way that we've been approaching this? Is there anything that you would like done differently that would help you in supporting, in supporting the work that you do? And again, it's just being adaptable and flexible. Again, our focus has to be as managers and supervisors is that our role is to help support our staff to, to empower them to do the best work that they possibly can. And so part of that process also needs to think about is, again, with our work in serving survivors, we focus so much on communication. It's also equally important that we need to be flexible and adaptable as some of the needs may change for our staff to be able to adapt um, to what's going to help them to bring, to help them be successful in their work. The other final question, which hopefully is, is an easy question for all of us to answer, is that do you meet with your staff on a regular basis? And does that seem to be the right fit? Is that frequent enough or is that too frequent? It's just kind of getting a sense of what's going to be the best way to support your staff. But at the very least, I know that there are times where I've worked with some nonprofits where they're so busy with the work that sometimes it's really hard for them to meet with their staff on a regular basis. And sometimes I've heard from staff where they may only meet with their supervisor, if they're lucky, once a month. Um, and for some staff that may work, but by and large for a lot of staff, especially if they're fairly new, they may need a lot more frequent contact and, and being able to have one-on-one -on -one contact as well with their supervisor. So again, the, the basic essence of this is really tailoring your supervision um, and approach to what's going to work best for that individual staff person. The other piece of it, if we can move on to the next slide, is how do you get staff feedback and input? And so these are just some common ways or some really um, common places that I think for most nonprofits or most of our agencies that will have, like, the first bullet being hiring interviews and staff orientation process. That's really important to get that information on the front end. Sometimes that may also impact your hiring decision as well. If you can kind of get a sense of what supervision style that a staff person may identify that's going to work best and support them. And again, it's not to say that you make your decision solely based on that, but that will get you a sense of is this going to be the right fit for the organization and also what's going to be needed for the supervisor to adapt his or her approach in way, the way that they supervise a staff person. So it's kind of helpful to get that on the front end. 
on an ongoing basis, it's where um, it's where you can also incorporate um, ways of getting staff feedback and input in supervision meetings. Sometimes you may be doing that in group supervision, um, but I really also encourage that that conversation also happens at, at on in, the, in individual supervision meetings. You know, asking questions, getting feedback from the staff person about their needs. It's also an, an opportunity to review their, their work plans and looking at project deadlines and whatever the task or projects or deliverables they may be responsible for, and just really kind of getting, checking in with them in terms of how the communication and dialogue and what kind of support and motivation they may need in, um, and to empower that staff person to continue to do their work in a successful way. Another third option is also looking at annual reviews and evaluations. It's also where it, I strongly encourage that sometimes it's, it's an opportunity for staff that even after they've had their initial performance review, giving them an opportunity to reflect and think about um, what are some areas of, um, of, of professional development goals or training that they need. Also, any kind of feedback that they can give on supervision. It shouldn't be just a reflection of the staff person's performance, but it's an also a key opportunity to get feedback in terms of how the supervisor is, is able to support that person in a better way, and also for the organization. If there's anything that needs to be improved from a, a systems or process perspective in, in terms of how they support and manage staff. So those are just key opportunities to think about that. And there may be other opportunities that you have where you have general staff meetings and such to get feedback. But I think it's also important to balance that with opportunities for individuals to provide feedback and input. And also to encourage strong and ethical communication between the staff person and with um, their supervisor as well. So are, do any of you online have any other suggestions or what have you done that you felt was successful in getting staff feedback about their needs. And so if you want to just feel free to, to jot that down in the chat box, that'd be really helpful. So basically it's an approach for us to look for opportunities in, um, in the way that we currently operate our organizations and thinking about how that could be helpful to our peers on the line or also how that might help to improve some of the current systems and processes that we may have in trying to support and empower our staff. So Michelle, any feedback from folks? There's nothing in the chat right now. Oh, here we go. Marcina says, as a coordinator of a new program, I called each staff after a call out. Oh, a call out. Um, I get it. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I'm assuming to check in. And then Julie right. says, I struggled with 10 staff um, that, at our, that our meetings can become kind of unwieldy, uh, but don't sure. have time to meet individually with each person. Um, Lisette says, we have implemented anonymous online surveys, and we conduct them twice a year. Questions around the agency, managers, and how we do things, just kind of getting opinions. Okay. I think that all, they all sound like great opportunities. I think I also appreciate the fact that there's a way for staff to provide anonymous feedback and input. Um, so I think that's helpful. I know that um, I appreciate also the comment about that it's hard when you may have multiple or you have 10 staff you need to supervise, so meeting with them individually on a weekly basis or even on a monthly basis can be challenging. But I really would encourage you if there's any opportunity. So quite often you may be meeting with them in group settings and doing um, staff meetings, like doing it as a joint staff supervision meeting. But I would really encourage you if you can to just even try to have, even if they're quick check-ins or 15-minute check-in, trying to integrate that into your schedule if at all possible to try to at least meet with them is that all possible once a month or even every other month, just so that they have an opportunity for them to check in and build that connection with you as well. So, Ellen, um, but I know that that's a challenge. Yes. Yeah, Ellen, a couple more people have kind of chimed in. Maddie um, from a local program here says, we have Monday morning meeting. Every Monday morning we have breakfast mm -hmm. together and check in. Um, and um, Chris says at staff meetings and program team meetings, in addition to supervision, um, and then 
Francine is asking, how has she done the survey? I'm assuming that question is to Lisette, and maybe Lisette can answer that in the um, how you do your online surveys. If you could just put that in the chat box, Lisette, and answer Francine's question. Sure. Um, Great question. Mar Martina also says that the staff were very open uh, with good things and problems when it was fresh on their mind. Mm -hmm. So kind of taking that opportunity when, right. uh, the, when instead happening. of waiting, kind of addressing things more immediately. Right. And I, I think, again, it's, it's also about trying to build that, that relationship and nurturing that relationship and trust that we have with our staff. Um, I know that all of us have incredibly busy schedules, but building that opportunity so that if there is an issue that has, that has come up, like in between our regular meetings or such, that they feel comfortable enough to come to you and talk, talk to you and problem solve. So again, I think um, it's going to be trying to find that whole balance in the way that we can kind of build that rapport and be able to provide that level of support and that also staff can feel like they can come to you when there's an issue or concern. Yeah, and I agree, Ellen, and just, you know, just having multiple nexus points for, for mm -hmm. opportunities for that direct, and, uh, direct communication and, and honest feedback. Right, right. And again, I think that's because we ultimately have that embedded in the way that we provide services to our survivors. But that's also important that, that if we're able to build that, that organizational culture and climate for that to also happen organically within our organization, that that really helps to build that and strengthen that, that relationship with our staff and also helps to retain them. So thank you, everybody, for the feedback. And again, I really want to encourage you folks to, to share the, those questions and comments. Let's move on to the next slide. And the next slide should be about employee engagement. Yep. Um, and so basically, we, when we talk about employee engagement and again, building that connection, it's about helping to help them be more invested in the organization. And, and quite often, I know I hear for, from many of us in the field that we really talk about really trying to help our organizations be more transparent and um, in the way that we do our work and the way that we're invested in the community and the community's invested in us. Um, and that also, you know, quite often I hear from staff and from management at, or directors at these agencies really talking about wanting to have that level of transparency. And, and again, it all has to be balanced with privacy issues and the legal requirements that we have. But I think in terms of how our organization, some elements of how our organization functions that we can really focus and bring that level of integrity and transparency in the way that we do our work. So partly it's really, and it's about sharing information that every staff person should know to be able to do their work successfully and be invested in the organization. So it really talks about our staff. Do they know what our agency's mission and vision? And usually that's, that's pretty common. I haven't come across very many individuals saying, I didn't know I'm the mission and vision of the organization. The other part of it is also talking about our history, how the agency, the founding story or the, the formation story of our agency, um, how the agency was founded, what are some of the, what's the philosophical framework, the values um, or core values of the organization, what was it founded on. A lot of this we talk a lot about in terms of anti-oppression, anti-racism, um, what our anti-violence movement is really about and what all those different elements mean. Um, I know that for many of the sexual assault and domestic violence organizations or in our field, we, that's partly the essence of the philosophy and the historical framework and usually embedded in the core values of the organization. So really, and if there's other elements in terms of core values, that is that shared with staff right at the get-go when they come on board? Do they understand what that means? Do they, can, would they be able to articulate that to other staff or to folks outside of the organization? And also, can they help, do they share in that? The other part of it is also understanding the organizational culture. And so particularly uh, some of the, the comments that I have related to that is what is our commitment as an organization to leadership development, professional development of our staff, and probably you know, in terms of the work that we do that's trauma-informed, and also what it means in terms of self-care. And, and I know for many of us in our field, we struggle with that self-care element quite often. Um, in terms of practicing for ourselves and also what it means for the organization. So it's an opportunity to kind of really think about that and is that part of our culture 
And if it is part of what our culture is, how does that come out in the processes? How does that come out in the way that we supervise staff? Is that also something that we encourage staff to integrate in their work plans? And um, I know by and large from my experience, it's, it's still something new for many nonprofits to really have that be part of staff work plans. So, um, and that's something I strongly encourage that, um, that if we can, that, that should be one of the elements that we really try to encourage and have staff build that in because our work is so intensive um, and quite often we're dealing with so many different elements of vicarious trauma in the work that we provide for survivors. The other piece that we talk about in employee engagement that I usually encourage to be on the checklist is also what are individual staff responsibilities as it relates to our various grant obligations or deliverables, like in terms of what is each staff person's responsibility for various objectives or data points or, you know, like number of clients being served or whatever the, the role is for that particular staff person, do they understand how they feed into those grant progress reports and do they understand what specific deliverables they're responsible for? So it's kind of important to think about do we share that information? And quite often I found for some some organizations that they struggle with that, that they may not be sharing that information with the staff, or the staff said, I've never seen the grant. The grant. I know that I'm supposed to give them data for the reports, but I've never seen any of the grant information. And so I'm not saying that you have to share sensitive info like salary info, but just in terms of what are they responsible for, for any of your specific agency's grants or roles. And, the, and, and what's so important by this is that the more that the staff knows on how they play, what role they play in, um, or what role they have in their specific grants, they can also help to help give you more vibrant reports, give you more information that can help to make more vibrant progress reports, or even as you develop the various grant proposals or the renewal proposal for that grant, that the staff can help provide helpful information to help enhance your, your proposals or an enhance your reports. So it's just and Ellen, I would just think about. Yeah. Ellen, I would just add to the grant information deliverables, which I think is such a great point um, and super helpful for staff to just read the grants that they're on, um, mm -hmm. is um, the information about, for, particularly for Washington, uh, CSAPs or specifically for them, you know, understanding accreditation and what it means to be accredited okay. and the, the core uh, core service standards and reading them and understanding them. And for DV programs, I would say also the, there's the WACs as well. That all there's a, a great amount of information that can just really enhance um, staff's ability to, to do their jobs, do them correctly, and to really be perform at their best. Right. And I think that, that's such a great point, especially as your state has accreditation processes. And I know in California they have that as well, or we call them service standards. And so I think, again, helping making sure that, that staff, they have that information or they've been exposed to that and they're really encouraged to read, understand it. And that also should help to drive some of the conversations as, it talk, as we talk about work plans and also as we talk about um, in doing even joint supervision or joint staff meetings or joint supervision meetings to really help staff to be able to make appropriate decisions, too, that can help to enhance the work and ensure that the agency stays in compliance too, especially if there's that accreditation piece. Any other thoughts, or uh, Michelle, any other thoughts that you may have about that? Uh, no, that's great. Um, somebody okay. in the chat box had asked for sample work plans, and I, I let her know that those were coming. <laughs> yep, they are coming. So actually, let's move on to the next slide. So. Um, and again, this is all background information on the employee engagement. It's just and it, what you may want to put under the grant info is the accreditation standards. It's something I would encourage you to add to the checklist for those of you on, online. So when we talk about the, the next piece is that how we go about building staff work plans. And so that usually I come from the mindset and come from every organization that I've worked with that every staff person, even including myself, if I'm the director of the organization, that I'm really building a work plan for the year. Or, or even if you want to start off on a smaller time frame, that's fine. If you'd rather do it on a quarterly basis, that's fine. But I think it's totally fine to encourage folks to think about it from a broader year-long perspective. So every staff person should develop a work plan on an annual basis based on your agency's fiscal year. Um, 
or you can do it on a calendar year, whatever works best, but normally fiscal year because most of your grants are probably tied to that kind of framework, and that their individual work plans should include key deliverables, which are the tasks, projects, or activities that the, that the staff person is responsible for and the timeline. So they should probably have that information if it's related to a grant or related to any other specific timeline within your organization. That staff should understand the grant deliverables, as I mentioned in the previous slide, what they are responsible for. The second element is program or grant reports, their respective deadlines, including any internal deadlines that you have for agency review. So say, for example, if you have a grant, a semi-annual grant report that is due 30 days at the conclusion of the, count, the, the fiscal year. So say your fiscal year operates January through December and you have a grant, um, your progress report covers July through December, and that your grant report is due sometime in January. What you probably want to do is you, that the staff person would know when the final deadline of when it needs to be submitted to, the, to your funder um, or your funding source. But what's more important is setting that timeline back in terms of what is the appropriate timeline within the agency so that there could be the appropriate supervision or supervisory or director's level of review before the grant report is submitted. So it's usually kind of building in those internal timelines, but also asking the staff person to help look at how they want to set those timelines that would meet that specific internal timeline. So say if the internal timeline is the grant report is due on January 30th, your internal review deadline might be January 10th. The staff person may, may ideally want to even set it earlier than that based on their, their other responsibilities within their work plan. But it's just giving them a sense to have that level of ownership and responsibility to develop the appropriate timelines to get a specific task or project done um, in an appropriate way and allows them to own it and they can have that level of internal accountability for that. The other thing is also including in work plans, what are the elements for training, self-care activities, as I mentioned earlier, and what are the timelines for that? And so partly it might, be, it might be a monthly timeline that they might be looking at some level of internal training that they may need to be able to do their job or that you, you as the supervisor is agreeing upon that you want them to get a level of training on a specific task or if it's self-care that you know that that staff person or they're, they're talking about that they want to be able to do this particular activity on a monthly basis or whatever the frequency may be, but they can create those timelines. And so basically the staff work plans would really be an opportunity for the staff person to draft up how they view their job based on all the information that you provided for, based on the last slide when we talked about internal engagement or employee engagement, thinking about all their the grant responsibilities and deliverables that they may have or the projects that they're responsible for, but creating a work plan in terms of the timeline. And it might have multiple elements. It might be one piece of it might be their regular work that their job may be doing community or community education or outreach, and they're responsible for X number of presentations each month, but they're setting up the timelines in terms of how they're doing the planning for it, how they're doing the actual presentation, the follow-up. So there's all these different elements that may be under that one task that they would have timelines for. So again, it allows to have a more visual approach to really think and planning, proactively planning, but letting that staff, staff person drive that process. And, in, and that your role as a supervisor is really reviewing it to make sure it's complete, it has all the elements, or if there needs to be some negotiation about the timelines that you could provide that level of input and ask them to revise it. So let's move on to the next slide that kind of gives you just some key elements of what a work plan, how it may look. And it doesn't have to be an extensive document, but essentially the sample staff work plan template would have these different elements. Like the first one would be goal and objective. And so it might be related to the accreditation standards or a grant, a grant deliverable that they have. And so they could write that element in like it might be community education or serving clients, you know, serving um, X number of survivors so that they could write down what the activity is below each element, the anticipated time frame. And when they complete that, they would be able to say what they were able to do, that that would be under the deliverables produced. 
and the completion date. So Ellie, as they a, develop the work, go ahead. We have yeah. a question in the chat box from Sarah who, said, who asked, how often would you review their progress on their work plan? I think what's helpful with the work plan is that should be pretty much something that if you're meeting with them on a monthly basis or however your frequency is, that that would help to drive some of the conversation for that part of the, the supervision meeting should be about let's review where you're at with your work plan. Thank and, you. and particularly letting the staff person, if the staff person is saying, I don't think I'm going to meet this deadline, then that's an opportunity to have that discussion to renegotiate that timeline. And that they should be looking ahead because some of the deliverable, the, the first one on goal and objective should be probably repeated multiple times within their work plans depending on the scope of their job. And then the other elements related to professional development or training goals and self-care goals, you may only have, you may have that only reflected once or twice on the work plan, if that makes sense for folks. And again, it's just giving you a, a template or a beginning on how you would just formulate the grid to make that happen. Does that answer the question, or Michelle, is there anything you want to add? Uh, no, I, I mean, I think you're, that's really perfect. Okay. And again, feel free to ask questions about that, but I, I would just keep it simple as first, um, and that really you're looking at when your staff are developing the work plan for the year, they're really only thinking about completing the first two columns of each element. So under goals and objectives, they would just be completing what are the key activities, and that might be just in bullet points and the anticipated time frame. And then as they complete those elements, they start filling in the deliverables produced and the completion date. And again, you feel free to adapt this any way that you want, but those are the key elements that I usually encourage to uh, staff begin working on developing a work plan. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the next slide, which is a polling question. And that is, do you, do you have your staff develop work plans every year? So I'd like to get a sense from people online how many of you actually have staff work plans in place and how many of you may be looking at integrated that. Okay, those are coming in. Okay, so um, 24 uh, or 68% say no, and 11 or 30% say yes, they do have staff development work plans every year. Okay. Well, great. Thank you, everybody, for providing that feedback. So um, I'm hopeful that with the folks that do have work plans, if there's any additional thoughts or feedback that you'd like to share with um, the folks online, that, that would be great. And I'm hopeful that for 68% of you that said no, that that's something that you may be looking at in terms of, um, you know, perhaps developing one or integrating that in the way that you supervise staff. I think it's a great tool in terms of helping with supervision and also really, as I mentioned earlier, it helps to empower staff to really be able to take responsibility and um, really own their job and really understanding how it all fits in within the organization and really taking um, being able to, to manage their own projects and their timeline appropriately that meets, that satisfies the overall general timeline for the organization. So let's yeah, move on to the next thing. Yeah, go ahead. Ellen, you go and ahead. I have talked so much about just getting staff to buy in, right, to have that buy-in mm -hmm. and to have their own so that it's not, you're not motivating them from the outside as a supervisor, that they're motivated, they're independently motivated, right. um, and then supported by you instead of, you know, the other way around, so that they're independently motivated yes. by. These are things that have to get done. These are things that have to get be done for survivors, for our funding, for our agency, for mm -hmm. our community, you know, and that, that, that we're shifting that motivation that way so that um, we can move away from just being the gatekeeper of information and saying, here's this thing that has to get done this week or, or next week. Um, so I really, I really appreciate this, this model. Um, Maddie on the... Um, uh, Q&A box says, I love this, totally going to implement it 
uh, during the coming fiscal year. And Julie says, ours is not a formal work plan, but we do goals and training needs as a part of the evaluation. Okay. Well, no, thank you everybody for the feedback. And again, I, I think as Michelle mentioned, it's a great tool. It really helps with the buy-in. It really helps to motivate staff. They can kind of really see how their work fits within the entire scope of the organization and that they're also able to manage and control their own internal timelines. Um, so often it's sometimes hard. I know for even myself as a supervisor, um, when I supervise staff and that we have so many different projects that are going on within the organization. And it's just helpful that when I'm able to view the work plan and that, you know, we've talked about that these are some of the things that need to get done within the next three months for the organization, um, that I know that when the staff develops a work plan that they have it all in place and that they've, they've worked out all those pieces and that really my role is helped with supporting them rather than just having to feel like I'm chasing them to make sure that things are getting done. But I can see that with the work plan. Um, that they, they have mapped out all those different needs and that normally when we're checking in for supervision, I can see where they're at and it makes total sense because I can see it, how it fits within the broader picture and that also they have, that they've developed that vision, they know what needs to happen and sometimes they're able to build upon it and really enhance the work that needs to be done as well. So I think it just gives so many opportunities by, by creating that engagement and buy-in and really letting them kind of take ownership of what what that project or task that needs to be completed. So it's just a great tool in that regard and has so many benefits in that regard. So the, the next polling question is about staff should develop their own work plans every year as it will increase their ownership for their job duties, tasks, and timelines as it relates to the organization's services and operations. True or false? So if you want to just take a couple of seconds to just respond to that question. Okay, it's in process. Okay, 97% say true. Great. So I think that was a pretty, um, pretty easy question in that regard. And so, yeah, you have it correct. That, that's really what this is about, what we've been talking about, that by developing their own work plans, it really helps to create that level of ownership for job duties, tasks, and timelines, and that it really benefits the organization in that regard. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide, which is about employee performance reviews. Okay. So when we talk about that with employee performance reviews, and it sounds like almost all of you have um, some type of review process in place. As I mentioned earlier, it's something that um, we really encourage that it's completed annually. It includes an opportunity for um, staff to be able to provide feedback, self-evaluation and feedback. Um, some, there are different various approaches to employee reviews. Some of them are really focused on the supervisor providing their level of feedback, but I really encourage this to be a mutual process where sometimes you allow staff to provide that self-reflection or evaluation, especially as you have work plans in place. If once you begin integrating that, it's also helpful for staff to begin evaluating themselves and they could evaluate their own performance and then providing an opportunity that there are templates out there where it provides the staff person to do that self-evaluation reflection. Um, and then it's also an opportunity for them, the, the supervisor, to get and reflect on that. Um, the opportunity with employee performance reviews, usually elements, is that any problems or challenges should have been addressed in terms of regular supervision meetings so that there are no surprises in the annual review. If there is anything that in terms of providing critical feedback to the employees, hopefully, and again, with the tool of the, the staff work plan as well, like if you have a staff person that's really challenged with meeting timelines, that should be coming out in the work plan process and in supervision meetings. So before you begin to address that in the, the um, annual performance review, it shouldn't be a surprise to the employee at that point. It should not be the first time that this is the conversation that's happening. Um, the other part of it is that professional development goals 
should be included for the coming year. That should be an integral part of the work of the performance review. And that also there should be recognition that should be given for good performance. And hopefully that's also being done during regular supervision meetings, but it's also not an opportunity to codify that in the annual performance review. And hopefully that it's attached if your organization has the capacity to be able to provide, uh, you know, even if it's a small salary increase or if there's an opportunity from a professional self, a development standpoint to upgrade the position, like it might be that if you have a position of prevention educator that you might have prevention educator too, like some sort of step level, that those are opportunities to think about or like senior prevention educator or however that may be within your organizational structure that there may be opportunities to provide a level of promotion or recognition for excellent performance. So it's just something to consider if you don't have those systems in place. It also depends on quite often if you're looking at these types of structuring um, of positions in terms of different step levels, that that may be something that you also, you definitely would need to have some conversation with your board and integrating and building that into your overall agency's organizational structure and, um, and obviously having a budgetary impact as well. So um, any questions about this before we move on to the next slide? Succession planning. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to succession planning. So succession planning, there's a toolkit that is referred to with the project that I used to work with, with um, Michelle on through the resource sharing project that we have the link there on the very bottom of the slide that I would encourage you to take a look at that we developed specifically for sexual assault and domestic violence programs um, that goes into much more depth. But really, when we talk about succession planning, we're not just talking about leadership transitions in terms of, you know, when there's an executive director uh, transition or board member transition. We're really talking about succession planning that should be addressed throughout the entire organization and not just focused on leadership positions. It should include transition plans for all board and all staff positions when you are looking at this holistically. Um, the other part of that succession planning, it leads to overall organizational sustainability as the organization creates and institutionalizes systems and processes to solidify operations at all levels. So staffing is one piece of this, but it's really also looking at all the processes and ensuring that you have good processes, systems in place so that you can ensure continuity of services and also hopefully continuity within staffing as well. So when we move on to the next slide, this is really a repeat of what I've shared earlier from, um, as a model from Marcus Lemonis about the three P's of a successful organization. That is so key when we talk about it for, for succession planning, that we really have to look at the, the people that we have in place in terms of board, staff, positions, and planning for transitions that we are also looking at process, what are the processes and systems and procedures that we have in place to ensure that the organization functions and develops and provides for good services that we provide for the community. And so that succession planning is really predicated on looking at all three P's and making sure that we have all three elements in place and that we have strong systems in place um, for, to support all of these elements. Um, in order for the organization to really plan successfully for any type of succession planning. So let's move on to the next slide. And again, I'm just kind of providing quick highlights from the toolkit. The toolkit provides a lot more templates, and it also has a sample work plan in there as well, um, the template, and it has a lot of great tools in there. So it's not just the discussion of all these elements, but providing some really practical tools and resources that you can utilize. To, to jumpstart your organizational succession planning process. So the next start is talking about the jumpstarting, that it's an opportunity to strengthen and document your organizational systems and processes by including discussions of succession planning in your, your board meetings, your overall staff meetings, supervision meetings, management meetings, performance reviews, and staff training. So really looking at what systems and procedures need to be in place. Do we have good documented process for how all of these systems need to happen and also that we documented well what is involved in each person's job. I think one of the key things for individual position um, in just thinking about succession planning is just thinking about 
what are the three most important things? The key question I would ask is three most important things that anybody who is going to step into your job, if should you, should that particular staff person get sick, go out on leave, whatever happens, what's the three most important things that that per the person who's going to step in or fill in for them would need to know to be able to do that job successfully? So not just understanding the job description, but what are three core pieces. And so if they tell you those three things and it's not noted in the job description or not noted, it should be noted in some sort of checklist for that position in terms of where to find the information and how to go about making that job happen. Ellen? The other piece, yes? Uh, I just wanted yes. to add one thing that um, the staff at Wixap do um, is we have what we call wikis, which are um, online documents that we have within our um, mm -hmm. Google Drive, which is where we have our email and our calendars and everything. And we each have a place where we can kind of add and change information about our particular positions because each of them are so different than one another. Right. We often work in, in, in independently. So we have that in case, and I'm, and I'm always, I'm constantly going back and saying, you know, when I read this when I first started here, what else did I need to know? Or what's changed since then? And going back and revisiting it over time. Because although I have no plans to leave, I know that it still has to be there and I'll forget to add in really important information if I don't do it um, kind of when I'm thinking about it. Exactly. Or even if somebody goes, you know, that quite often if somebody gets sick or goes out on extended medical leave, that's where things are left in a void. Like where did they leave off on the job? Like we may know the general elements of what they're supposed to do, but what is it, where are they at day to day in terms of making things happen? And that's where also the work plan is helpful because it can document, especially where um, the piece where deliverables may have been completed. Like if somebody is planning for a specific training or, or community outreach piece or they're providing client services in a specific community, that you kind of know where they're at in that process. And it's also important like sometimes where it may not necessarily need to be documented in a job description, but where do you find this information? Where do you know? What has their contact been with you know, specific people in a community or one of the partners that you're working with. That, like, where do you find those pieces of information and know where things are left off? So those are key elements that we need to think about. And I think, like you're mentioning, Michelle, that this wiki is helpful, that that can kind of help fill in the blanks so that if anybody's needing to kind of step into that role due to an unexpected transition, that we can help fill that void and not be left in the dark. Right. Because we know as nonprofits that there's mm -hmm. so much covered under uh, other duties as assigned on our job descriptions. Mm -hmm. And it changes when we lose funding and lose positions and those things don't get updated and then we lose that really important, those really important pieces right. just because of the nature of our work and our structures. Exactly. Exactly. So it's just really helpful to kind of just begin thinking about that in terms of how do we fill in those gaps, how do we begin to get capture that information so that we know so that if there's an unexpected departure of somebody or somebody goes out on leave or even sometimes when somebody plans leave, that we need to kind of be able to make sure that we have a lot of pieces in place or that we have as much information that we can so that somebody who's going to help fill in that role, even temporarily, is going to be able to not be left, that it's not going to be so disruptive to the organization or stop the organization from moving forward. So it's just trying to plan. It's, it's really about thoughtful planning or preparedness. So some of the other elements that we talk about in jump-starting the succession planning process is also looking at anti-oppression and anti-racism trainings for your staff and board. If that's, that that's something that's essential to the work that we do and that we're the philosophical framework of how our organizations were founded and what our organizations are about, that that's something that it shouldn't have to be stated, but I know quite often it's a helpful reminder but that we want to make sure that we take a very inclusive approach in how we integrate these types of trainings and that they should be part of ongoing training for staff and our board as well so that we really are able to walk the talk from a holistic level for our organization. The other part of it is also talking about succession planning or including in succession planning what you talk about in terms of strategic planning and visioning meetings for your agency. So however that may be integrated for your organization, 
it's also important to think about it from a succession planning lens as well. If we move on to the next slide, it's, it's basically like a, a quick little checklist. It's also included in the succession planning toolkit that was referenced a few slides ago, um, and the link is on there, and it also will show up at the end of this presentation as well, that these are some key elements to just incorporate into a checklist for if you want to engage in a holistic succession plan for your agency, that it's an opportunity to document, institutionalize, and review your existing processes and procedures for one, staff orientation. How do you train new staff and orient new staff? Two, ongoing training, including anti-oppression and anti-racism. The third element we talk about is job descriptions. Does it include what new staff need to know? And it's kind of the elements that we talked about for engagement in terms of mission and vision, the organizational culture, the core values and philosophy, all those different elements. Is that included um, in what's important for what new staff need to know in addition to the job description? The, the fourth element that we talk about is client service procedures and processes. Are there any gaps when you look at it holistically for the entire agency? Um, staff procedures for work plans, grants, reports, even how you may provide computers or computer passwords or access, all of those things. Finance and administration, where the keys are left, how people access the bank account, all those different elements that are so important if you have a, a, a departure, a sudden departure of a key person that has access to these different elements. So that, those are the things that you want to make sure that you have included in some staff procedures or checklists, that that information is documented. I've encountered a couple of nonprofits where I worked with where they have their finance person that had access to the bank accounts and all of that, and that person went out on medical leave unexpectedly. And even the executive director and some of the management staff said, oh my gosh, I don't even know how we're going to access the bank accounts or who's going to do payroll and all of that, because they didn't have the access or they didn't document the passwords for some of these pieces. And so, or the procedures for those pieces. And so it's important to make sure those pieces are documented well and that not just the person who's responsible for it, but other people that need to know that information know where to find it so that your organization is not left in, in a crisis in terms of not knowing how to move forward because everything has stopped because you can't take care of certain pieces, of, key pieces of business because one person's been out on leave. So it's just kind of important to think about those key staff procedures that would leave your organization in an emergency. Um, yeah. Other things, sorry, go ahead, Michelle. Oh, I was just going to add to that list too, again, thinking about accreditation because it's so significant mm -hmm. for our community sexual assault programs here that I remember you know, when I was a new manager um, and I had just stepped into this position and, and it was like, oh, and we have accreditation. And I was like, I don't know what that is. And then there was like a million binders full of things and I was trying to figure it out. So, uh, and then of course, you know, going through accreditation and, and that being really stressful, that if we can build in accreditation to our regular kind of planning and succession planning and you know, bookending that with our what we talked about in the beginning, you know, getting buy-in from staff and having them be familiar with the things that we need to do as an organization to maintain our accreditation, maintain our status, mm -hmm. maintain our grants, um, that that's going to spread that knowledge out. So it's not just one person who maybe is brand new who is now responsible for accreditation is not quite sure even what it is, let alone how to go through it. Right. Well, I think that's an excellent point. And again, like any of those key elements that are important and that I, I would say accreditation, that's such a key aspect of your organization that having everybody become knowledgeable about what are the, the basic standards and also that that's included in some of the discussions that succession planning is also in, integrated with that. So excellent point. Thank you, Michelle. Um, some other elements that we would probably add to the checklist and you probably can add some others as well. The master calendar of any key due dates for grant proposals, reports, um, you know, your board of directors meetings, training, anything that are key pieces that are key critical dates for the organization, that you should have a master calendar for that and really begin thinking about how you talk about succession planning as you also talk about um, 
developing process, you know, documenting that process and procedure, and who helps to provide input or maintain that calendar, and where it can be found. And then also key administrative procedures and processes like the banking, grants. A lot of this may be something that more of the executive director or executive leadership of the organization would be concerned about, but just making sure that you've documented those processes as well and how that they need to be accessed. So that just covers, that's just covering the key highlights of succession planning and how to begin looking at that holistically for your organization. And as we move on to the next slide, I'm just going to open up to any final questions. We have like about another little more than 15 minutes. Um, but just wanted to answer any questions or if you have any concerns or feedback that you'd like to share. We'll wait a, wait a minute because sometimes it takes people a minute to kind of sure. think about their questions. <clears throat> Go ahead and use the chat box and I'll read it uh, out loud. And I think Michelle, if you want, if you want to flip up, put up the next slide, which has um, my contact info and just some key resources. It also has a link to the succession planning toolkit. Yeah, I will. Um, there's somebody. Julie has said, um, "I like the idea of a wiki. Can everyone edit those documents? And how do you track the changes, or do you?" And I, I, personally, for for our system at Wixap, we don't track the changes, and not everyone can edit them. Uh, but we try to make sure that everybody can access them in case somebody needed to um, be able to pick something up. And we would just have the, the person um, edit it who's kind of in charge of that particular project or position, and, and their supervisor probably as well. Um, and then everybody else can access it and take a look at it if they needed to. Thanks for sharing that, and, and great yeah. question. And earlier somebody had mentioned, and I forgot to say it out loud, but somebody had mentioned about having um, external people coming in that they utilize maybe an external person to come in and talk to staff to get feedback, um, which I think is a really interesting um, mm -hmm. conversation for us to have too as, as far as like what is using external consultants to kind of uh, be able to come in and ask questions about our organization so that it's mm -hmm. kind of a, like as far as succession planning goes, you have a fresh person to come mm -hmm. in and say, well, what about these things or what do people do in, in these right. scenarios? And I know that's something I do a lot with sexual assault coalitions nationally, you know, when they're planning on having an executive director turnover, you know, in addition right. to talking about, you know, passwords and things like that and having sometimes external consultants to be able to come in and kind of hold a mirror up or, or help you work through right. some things in a more general way, um, help you figure out how to write things down that's outside of your um, kind of organizational culture's lingo. Uh, we use a lot of acronyms and shorthand and things like that. And so I think that that's a big thing to look at when we're doing um, um, a lot of our organizational culture work or our succession planning work because that also impacts how people are onboarded. Um, and right, feel uh, right. included and feel a part of it. Um, so I just think it's an, it's an interesting um, consideration uh, for working with an external consultant. And of course, Wixap and Wiskative are available to do a lot of those kind of things. Right. And that's great, especially if the coalition is able to help provide that as a resource. Um, and sometimes that's a good way to kind of get the process going for an organization. It doesn't say that you have to you have to go down that path, but I think it's a real viable option, especially if the organization has the resources to be able to do that. I have another comment in the chat box from mm -hmm. Rachel. She says, uh, sure. we use an agency-wide shared calendar which helps with not only Great. report and grant deadlines, but also helps us stay connected to each other's day-to-day -day happenings. We have multiple offices and sometimes they feel very disconnected or isolated, so this helps us feel more connected. I think that's a great tool, and, and honestly, I've utilized that before at, at some of the organizations I've been a part of because we've, you know, where we had more than one office, and I think um, quite often if there's a way to share a master calendar, it also helps for folks to know what's happening 
and it also helps to create some of those timelines as well. And, and it's also a great way to manage larger projects as well because sometimes you're able to build in some of those pieces and also incorporate who's responsible for what. But I think that master calendar is so key and I think that's a great way you folks are handling it. Yeah, Rachel, thank you. Yeah, great suggestion. Yeah, Chris in New York says, uh, we use a group calendar as well, which has become essential in sharing our, our co like common conference room, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it sounds like a lot of you have great systems in place. And so I would say keep doing that. And if you want to build upon it, I think that's very important. Again, you've got some beginning pieces to help with um, to talk about organizational succession planning too, that that's a great starting point. Anything else? I mean, I think some of you already probably, sounds like you may already have some of these elements in place, and that's great. So it's, again, those are things you can check off that you already have. So it's just thinking about if there's anything else you would want to add to that based on what we're talking about. And, again, feel free to look at the toolkit, too. Yeah, and um, any uh, additional questions or comments? Sorry, I have the resources uh, slide up now. I was a little delayed. Mm -hmm. um, Chris and also again, says, lately in our desire to de-silo the work, we are meeting regularly to plan. Um, mm -hmm. uh, she's from a coalition, so she's talking about um, meeting regularly to plan conferences and site visits and regional calls with members so that um, they can all be part of those conversations, um, and it, which is helpful. Good. And again, I, I just want to encourage folks, anything from these slides, you know, feel free to um, integrate that in any of your checklists or tools that you have in place or, or if you want to create one. Feel free to adapt any of it. That's going to make sense for your organization. There is a sample work plan template um, uh, that I, is in the succession planning toolkit that kind of highlights some of that these elements were highlighted in today's presentation. But you can pretty much take that template that's out of the succession planning toolkit, um, or you know, and and there may be some stuff that I'm going to be working with um, Michelle on in terms of some follow up with you all, but. But again, anything that could be helpful, feel free to adapt it for your agency's use. Um, and just keep up the great work that you folks are doing, too. And my contact information is there, or feel free to contact Michelle or Annette or anybody at WhatsApp if there's any other follow-up questions that you have or concerns that you have. I'm more than, than willing to assist you all. Um, again, I want to um, thank Ellen. Um, I also want to call attention to the number of management resources we have, quite a few management tips. One of them that's coming to mind is on organizational values. Um, take a look at that because I feel like that one really connects with what we were talking about in the beginning in establishing that staff buy-in um, and being able to one, one uh, person from uh, that rights for nonprofit AF was talking about, um, you know, connecting when they talk about things in staff meeting, really connecting them to the organizational values, just so that they're staying rooted in that and 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 really maintaining mm -hmm. the buy-in and the passion for the work. So take a look at that resource which came out a couple of months ago on our website um, on organizational values. And I also want to uh, remind folks that. The next management webinar is going to be in March, and I had sent out a save the date for March 8th, and it's going to be March 7th, because March 8th is International Women's Day, and we uh, don't come to work on that day. So um, <laughs> please, uh, thanks, Ellen, so much for um, being with us and um, struggling through the, the uh, uh, techni technical difficulties. Um, please complete the evaluation that appears after exiting the webinar. You're going to re uh, receive a follow-up uh, email verifying your attendance. Um, and if you have any questions or additional uh, conversations that you want to have specifically 
uh, around any management issues, you can always call me at the WixApp office um, or email me at michelle at wcsap.org. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care.